So we got the player board set up here. The icons here indicate how much stamina you have and likewise for the mana. Over here on your right, you have your skills. Now these are currently skills that you can potentially get, but you don't have any right now. This is uh, your two starting dice and this one will get earned when you equip your first item. On your turn, you can do one of three different actions. Move, fight, or rest. And on the very first turn of the game, the player will have to do a move action. You can see he'll move to that space there, and it says five, and it's got the level one monster symbol in pairs. So there's gonna be five pairs of these guys laid out. You're gonna wanna choose your set based on variety. You're gonna tr probably want to have different dice numbers here. And you're gonna go for sets that you need to upgrade your skills. So for example, Say I grab this pair right here. This here tells you what kind of item it's going to equip, because when you defeat it, you flip it over. And this set symbol tells you how many uh, experience you gain. The dice symbol is what you need on a dice to defeat them, and if they're undefeated, the blood drops is how much damage you do to you. You gotta be careful about taking damage because it's hard to heal anything back. So say I decide to take these. They go on my player board at the top there. And then it's the next player's turn. There's no point in him resting, and there's nothing for him to fight. So he will move to the next spot up there, and he's got to flip one pair of level one monsters. So they will be added to the board, and then he gets his selection from all, everything that's already out on the board. So say he grabs these two. Back around to my turn, I could fight the two monsters I have, or I could move again. Now, it doesn't matter where you are, you're always gonna move up to the frontmost space ahead of someone. So I'm gonna move, I'm gonna add the monster, and then I'm gonna grab one. Now, the more you move and the more monsters you take, the more chances of you being defeated are. So, let's look at how a combat works. So I've got two dice to start. So I am going to roll my dice, I got a six and a three. Well, the three I can use to fight this guy. The six I can't use, but there's a lot of ways to mitigate. So I'm gonna use a mana. I'm gonna put that, and that lets me reduce or increase a dice by one. So I'll reduce this down to a five, and that defeats that guy. This guy here is left undefeated, so he's gonna deal two damage back at me. I can use my two stamina here. This means I need two reds and it's gonna block two damage. So if I put that there, I successfully block that monster. These guys go over to my sack and I can level up one gem each. When you level up, you can move the corresponding colors up one. Uh, whites are wild, so you can always move whites. So if, and you've got level one, two, and three skills in red, green, and blue. Now, if I moved a red off of, uh, off of here, and then a blue up. Since this skill is uncovered, I now have that. And what it does is it gives me one blue man into my pool for the rest of the game. Now, even though I got this skill, I still have to stop here on my way up. Now, as you move skills up past the first layer into here, that's when you can start equipping items. So my next turn comes around and I wanna rest. When you rest, you get to restore all of these. These will go back into your pool. And then you can equip any items you want. So just say I wanted to equip this. It goes right there in this slot. It now gives me an extra blue into my slot. If I ever unequip this ring, I gotta get rid of that blue again. And then I have this sword, which will take replace my native ability. It gives me an extra minus two ability. The purple means I can use a blue or a red to use that item. And you've also got to take the amount of gems from your pool, and you have to lock them on. When you rest, you can freely move gems back to your pool over here and equip different items. You can only equip items when you rest. And then you also check achievements. Now achievements are very important. Let's look up here at the top of the board here. 
So these here are only used to fight the big boss. On the other side, they'll give you like a plus two modifier you can use. So you've got your skills achievements. Um, the first person to unlock three skills would gain this. Uh, then five skills, then seven skills. You've got two gems of one color, two gems of another, three and three, four and four. And finally equipment, four levels worth of equipment, seven levels worth of equipment, and 10 levels worth of equipment. The first player to unlock a level two achievement would take this. And the first player to unlock a level three achievement would take this. And again, these are one-time uses and they're only used at the boss fight. So play is continuing. This track of movement is essentially the game's timer. Once someone gets up to this top space, they will reveal a monster as normal, and it's got a little treasure chest icon. Once that happens, every monster on the board gets flipped over to their item side, and starting in marching order, the players get to pick any one weapon. They don't get to level up for this, but they get to add it to their sack. And then they will add the next player board. It's also worth noting that when you do equip your first item, you get a third dice here. Now depending on the player count, um, we'll tell you which board to go next. If you're playing a four player game, you would go to board, uh, you would go to board uh, two and then three. So you can see in a two player game, you wouldn't use board two, but you would use board three next. Now usually there's two boards at a time, but for the purpose of this, I'm just gonna show you one at a time. So you're gonna continue marching up and battling. Now on some of the boards, you're gonna have this divine intervention tile on a space. When the first player hits that space, everyone is gonna get an extra dice. So you generally put um, the number of players worth of dice on top. And there's gonna be two to three of these gained per game, depending on player count. By the time everyone gets up to the Walls of Sanctum, Act 5. You're going to reveal five sets of cards, uh, a level 3 and a level 2. The players are going to stay on that board until they have defeated all of their demons that are on their board. Once they've done that, they will move up to the walls themselves. And then that's when the monster attacks for the first time. This here is the monster board. They're gonna be this deck of monster attack cards. Now they're gonna be uh, face up, but in this case, the other side. They're gonna be things like uh, take a penalty or lose a health, all of a different kind. So the first time a player moves up to the walls, you put two of these down. Then the next player, he can choose to keep fighting the demons he's fighting. He could choose to rest if he wants, or he can choose to move up to the walls himself if he's cleared his demons. So say he does that, moves up beside him. Then uh, when it's the player who breached the walls turn again, he'll put another card here. If there is a third player, they will move down to the bottom of that card. And then once the next card gets revealed, then everybody has to join the call. There's going to be one last chance. It's a free rest before everyone goes and fights the main demon. When that happens, we'll get five of these demon cards. Uh, this tile here, this is a rage tile. You can choose to flip this to the U side and it'll let you set a dice to any side. You only get this back if you have a demon card still on and one dice that you weren't able to assign and that gives you your rage back. So now, your skill table isn't used anymore. We go to the final battle. Your hero comes to your board and everybody basically does a round of fighting. So by this point, I would have five dice in my pool. And actually, let's take a minute to talk about skills. As you get skills, when they unlock, they end up coming over here and taking up a slot either on your person. This one gives me an extra potion slot or they take up a slot over on this side of the board. They'll, they'll uh, cover up the matching icon and they give you special abilities that'll help you in this final battle. There's always gonna be one skill that gives you an extra dice um, in a certain situation. Like they're 
Each class has different sets of skills, and each class lets them use that extra dice in a different way. But you do your, uh, you'd roll your dice. You have like whatever your mana is, and I've touched over potions, but you will have, you'll be collecting potions. You can always trade in an item for a potion throughout the game, and you can store um, a certain amount down here. Uh, before you roll your dice, you can drink a red potion to bring a red uh, thing off of one of your uh, attributes and bring it back to your pool. And same thing with a blue potion. So you're fighting these cards as you move along. So as you fight this, then you flip up these. And these are like hidden attacks. You've got to deal with these uh, before you can move on. When you're done doing all the fighting you can, then you're going to get a point of damage for every card that's still in the row. So in this case, if I got to here... I would take 2, 4, 6, 8, 11 damage that I would have to block. Now, typically, I would have more cooler items out here that'll that'll let me do uh, um, a little bit better job of fighting. You look at some of these uh, level 3 items here. You can see this one is awesome for blocking. This one lets you gives you an extra red and a blue, and uh, you can use any color to raise or lower your dice by 1. This one here, you can uh, ri move a dice to any number. You get the idea. A triple block, flip a dice to a two. So these level three items are really cool. Once a round of fighting's doing, for everyone that survives, the demon does a double attack. So similar to what happened at the gates here, he's going to put down two cards. Everyone's going to resolve it. Remember, it's going to be either take a penalty or lose a health. Then everyone does another round of fighting. You roll your dice, you see how many cards you can deal with as you move along. Now, you don't get to rest during this fight, so whatever you have going in is when you get to use it. And this is when your achievements will help you. They'll give you bonuses to your dice, they'll give you extra uh, mana or stamina. I don't think you can win without getting some achievements. And my son is insane with the achievements. He never lets me get any. Uh, once another round of fighting is done, then there's going to be... Another card, you deal one less card. Everyone's got to deal with that. And then everyone just does rounds of fighting until they're either dead or they're victorious. If everybody dies, whoever is further ahead on their line is the winner of the game. If it's tied, whoever has done the most damage on the card that they've on. Anytime you hurt a monster, if you wound it and you don't fully kill it, it stays wounded until the next time. And that's what those brown discs are for. Um, if everyone does survive, then whoever got the most achievements would be the winner. And if that's a tie, then they share the victory. Now, when it comes to the monster attacking and putting cards down, you can raise the difficulty of the game by increasing the number of attack cards because it's always going to be one less. You could go 3, 2, 1, 0 instead of 2, 1, and then 0. And that's the game. So that's Sanctum from Czech Games Editions. All right, so uh, game length. Um, it, it gets longer the more players you have. It starts with uh, about an hour at two players. And um, we played this just last night at game night, four players. And it took two and a half hours with uh, rules, instructions, and a little bit of the setup. Uh, this can definitely be reduced, especially when everyone is familiar with the game, because when one player starts to do, like, their leveling up and stuff, the next player can start right away. Or if a player is uh, going to do his fight, then the next player might start his. So there, you can start getting a little bit of an overlap on the turns, and this could dramatically speed up the game. But it's going to take a few plays to get there. Um, but I would say you're probably looking around 90 minutes to two hours for a four-player game. The components, you know, the cardstock's good, the card art is fine, the board art is great, all the, the cardboard and stuff is, is, is good, and I thought the minis were, were, uh, a standout. I thought they were, uh, spectacular coming from Czech Games. I wasn't expecting them to be that impressive, so I really like the minis, and, uh, I'm gonna get these painted, actually. Now the game is kind of like a, it, it's done in two parts. You've got your journey up to the final boss. And this is essentially the game's timer to get as equipped as possible for that final boss. It's essentially 
a drafting phase. You're essentially drafting all your items you're going to equip for the final boss. And you've got to draft the right combination of items uh, versus the, the gems you've unlocked into your pool that you can actually equip. So there's an efficiency and there's some proper decision making on what you're going to grab. So it's all, really, I would describe this as the coolest way of drafting cards ever because you're taking these cards, you're going to get them, but you do have to do a bit of a fight for them. Typically, you can mitigate to to fight as, a, you know, to get rid of a couple of cards at once. But if when you want to really collect, like if you want to grab a card, so you move up, so you pick up a couple more baddies, then you got a little bit more of a challenge. So there is a risk versus reward in what um, demons you're going to put on your player board and fight. So essentially... Everyone is drafting back and forth cards, and there might be a little bit of hate drafting too. If you can see that someone is looking for a set of armor to really fill out his his guy, maybe you want to jump ahead, grab those demons, because they always tell you what piece of equipment they have on them. you got to defeat them before you can actually look at the equipment. But uh, I just think it's a really unique and exciting way to draft cards. I'm, I'm a big fan of how it plays out. And... I don't think you can come up with a more thematic way of drafting cards. So the, I mean, it has the dice rolling, but I would describe this as a Euro game if I had to. And as a Euro game, this is probably the most thematic one out there. I mean, just even though you're you're collecting cards in essence and, and fighting them as you go, um, it's got that journey feel to it as you're moving up along the gates. The leveling up system is also wonderful. You've got your skills over here. You defeat a level 2 demon, you can move two gems up. You can pick where they move. And again, if you move them from the bottom, you're getting the better skills first, but it's going to take you longer to get those gems up to your gem pool to where you can start equipping better items. So there's that you know, uh, decision there. The game plays out, it almost feels like it's a cooperative game because everybody's marching together, everybody's fighting demons, and that's kind of a cooperative feel to it. But it's a competitive game, and again, that is a very unique feeling I'm getting from this game. I don't have any other game that feels like that. Like, everybody's kind of doing their own thing. You might be snagging something someone else wants, but... You know, everyone's just kind of fighting demons. Like, so you all you all feel like you're on the same side. I really like that. Um, as far as like, sometimes your turn comes around quick. If someone's moving, it's just simple as moving up. Uh, you grab your cards. Next person's turn. Uh, sometimes a fight can, you know, if everybody's doing a fight before your turn, you know, it could take a few minutes before your turn to come around. But the thing is, it's pretty fun watching everybody do their battles and see if they take a hit. See you you know, what they're going to do to mitigate their dice. So it's not agonizing waiting around for your turn. I think the flow of the game is pretty quick. This is a strategy game, and it is a game that you can become good at. However, there is still luck in the dice. Even though it is, there's dice mitigation coming out every crack of this game, you could still roll really well and have an advantage over everyone else. Now, you, you average out, you take the law of averages over the course of a game, everybody's going to theoretically hit their spell of good luck, but in the game last night, first turn of the game, my friend had two demons, both with a six. He rolls his starting two dice, two sixes. He didn't have to waste any resources, uh, you know, modifying his dice, using his rage, it was almost like he had a free turn because he rolled that good out a gate. So if you're consistently rolling good against players that are rolling things, they have to mitigate everything, there is that luck factor. That might be a problem for some someone looking just for a strictly um, strategic Euro game. Uh, that element of luck is there. Especially on the final, if you get to the final few cards of the final boss, Rolling good could really matter, especially when you're all out of stuff. However, the game is based around having the right equipment to deal with a string of bad luck and getting those achievements on the achievement board, like the first one to get 
you know, four items worth of levels equipped, four levels worth of items equipped, grabs an achievement. And all these things are one-time uses you use against that final boss. I have played, I am terrible at this game. I've played five games and I have not gotten a single achievement. I just, I don't know how to focus on any one particular thing in this game. And I, in my thoughts were, you know, I didn't look at this game as, you know, having the most life left after you survive the final boss. I looked at this game as, see how far you can get before you die. However, last night, I was the only one that got killed by the demon, and the other three players just escaped. And uh, the player with the most life points ended up winning. Having those achievements to go for is very important. You're going to want them in that final fight. Is this game replayable? Well, I would say, yeah, it's, it's replayable in the sense that you've got four characters that all play differently. Like, they all have completely different sets of skills. Unlocking those skill cards is, is fun. It's like, you know, you just start getting more powerful as you go up. It does have that Diablo leveling up feel. You can picture that little white outline piece of treasure dropping after you defeat them. And figuring out the most optimal way to play each of these characters is several, several games in itself. Then you've got the difficulty factor that you can increase at the end before you go to the final uh, or at the end after you do your first wave of fighting against the boss he flips up those attack cards where you flip his cards face over and it's like take a wound or or do this uh, have this negative effect instead of going two of those cards and then a round of fighting then one of those cards and then just rounds of fighting you start with three or four of those and and then that increases how much more punishment you have to uh, take at the end. And there's there's several other ways to make the game more difficult. So I would say it's pretty replayable. Is it going to start to feel samey after uh, 10 games? Um, I think that depends on the player. I think, uh, I think it could hold out after 10 or more games. And I think some people will feel like, oh, they've, I've played this five times. You know, it's, you know, you're moving along the path. You're trying to get the best armor and I'm gonna do this the same way every game I think there's enough variety in you know what armor and weapons you're gonna get every game and what skills you're gonna unlock sometimes you're not gonna get the right color guys out there to do the same thing so you got to take a little bit of a different approach so I would say it's moderately replayable so all in all uh, the game is fun I'm really happy with it it's gonna it's gonna stay in my collection so that you know I'm at the point now where I'm getting very critical of everything that comes in so it's gonna be hanging around I'm definitely gonna be playing this more um, the biggest takeaway I have from this game is just the unique feel it has with uh, first half of the game the journey getting your cards um, and then everybody having to survive and when the monster cards are on your player board and people are moving along each card you know, it's fun, it's really entertaining to watch your, uh, you know, your frenemies at this game uh, fighting. Part of you is cheering for them and part of you is hoping they can't defend and they end up dying so that you can get a little bit further ahead. But uh, I recommend this game. It probably sits around uh, an 8 out of 10 for me. I will catch you guys on the next one. Thanks for watching. I'm Jason Peacock. Thanks so much for watching another Dice Tower video. If you enjoy our videos, subscribe to the channel for more fun, comprehensive board game coverage. Also, consider joining us at one of our events. Come to Dice Tower Retreat, a small, intimate gathering where gaming is king. Join us for Dice Tower Cruise, the largest board game cruise. Attend Dice Tower West in Las Vegas for gaming fun on the West Coast, or Dice Tower East in Orlando in sunny Florida. Dice Tower Conventions, the friendliest gaming conventions on Earth. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower.